Welcome back to another episode of Church Hurts and the good, the bad, the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with the dash of recovery thrown in along the way. So if you've ever had questions about the church, about your spirituality, about your place in this whole, this whole confusing situation, then maybe you've even become a bit jaded in your attitudes towards religion overall. Hey, you've come to the right place. Our host, well, he was an honors philosophy major, ordained a Presbyterian minister, and he planted three churches along the way. He also taught at a prestigious university and was teaching pastor at a mega church. He even served as an executive coach for a while, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never tires of asking the one question on all our minds. Why? Why not? Let's bring him in, the host, of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. I was remembering this week of a time I sat in a church on a Saturday afternoon when I was barely out of seminary and I was traveling with a famous speaker. Now, it takes skill to hold an audience on a Saturday afternoon for a church conference, and this crowd was just mesmerized. The content was wonderful and compelling, but something was eating me up inside. And so I looked around at the audience again. What was bugging me? What was wrong? Little did I know that my perceptions at that time would lead to a major life change. These weren't my people. They weren't the kind of folks that one would want to go out and enjoy a proverbial beer with. I was too, it was just, they were too neat. I was too dirty. They were too clean. No matter how much I liked the message, I couldn't get away from the fact that somehow the people who follow a message says something about the messenger. Isn't it interesting that when the subject of church comes up, it doesn't take long before leaders become the topic of discussion. This pastor did this. That minister said that. My priest one time, why is it that leaders in the church and leadership in the church seems to get it wrong so often and make us want to run away? I mean, leaders hurt us. Church hurts. To help us navigate these waters today, I've invited a man who spent more time in church boardrooms than almost anyone else I know. His name is Tom Melzoni, and he's preached to thousands at a time been in churches so small, I've been in bathrooms that are bigger, and he knows where the bodies are buried in this story, with a PhD from Columbia University and president of a foundation that does a ton of good stuff and has his name on it. Uh, well, I'm just glad he's here. Welcome, Tom. Ah, uh, thank you, John. Always fun to be with you. Always fun. Well, you've gotten wise in your old age. You're, you're from... Sarasota, Florida. Now I remember when you were from Dayton and is Dayton's like in the middle of nothing, right? Yeah. It's five miles beyond the great commission. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside Christian joke, but it's a good one <laughs> to the ends of the earth. And then there's Dayton. <laughs> that's, right. that's a great city. I grew up there. Wonderful, wonderful city, but it gets cold in the winter. And so uh, I decided a couple of years ago that it was time to warm my blood and warm my bones. So I moved to Sarasota, Florida, and it's paradise. So, Well, I, I, I have had you replaced in my life with a son-in-law who's from the wrong side of Ohio as well. Uh, but we'll skip speaking about black and gold and the supremacy of Pennsylvania to get into your wisdom. And and I may sound a little cynical, Tom, but I always used to say that churches have guillotines outside their door, not for people coming out, but for the people who go into them. Sometimes they make such dumb decisions, just swear they cut off their heads before they went into it. 
Is, is that just overly cynical, or do you get what I mean? Oh, I, I, I'm laughing at it because uh, while we know church is a wonderful, wonderful place, you're exactly right. I, I, I have been privileged to, uh, to work with some of the most learned business persons in the world. And, and yet it seems as if when they walk into the church boardroom, they check their brains, you know, somewhere in the parking lot. I mean, it, it's as if all that, all that business savvy, and I mean, we're talking about really top-notch CEOs of the world, and, and they walk into a church boardroom and then everything becomes just absolutely numb, and they make some of those challenging decisions that you'll ever think about. In fact, I have to say to you, in one church, I always had this light bulb right outside the boardroom that, that I would literally just sort of unscrew a little bit before the meeting. And it would just sort of blink on and off a little bit because I knew that somewhere in the middle of that meeting, they were going to get into a discussion and, and in, in, in church board meetings sometimes with these good people, they, they can turn a short story, story into a long one. And, and they can make a meeting feel like eternity. And so when they'd get into the midst of a discussion that was never ending, I would just pause and say, hey, what are we going to do about that light bulb out there in the hallway? And, and, <laughs> and they would come up with a solution real quick, and we move right on. I mean, it's just amazing how, how little things like a light bulb can, can, can get their minds right off uh, of the topic and they'll, you know, they'll make a decision and go on. But seriously, I, 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 I'm just amazed at how people check their brains when they walk into a church boardroom. Now I have a theory as to why, but I want to hear your theory first. Well, I think it's fear. I think they walk in and, and, uh, they're so successful in their business that when they walk in, in, in their minds into the presence of God, they, they're feeling inferior. Uh, they're they're ob obviously feeling very strong and bold in their business. And we, all, we both know they ought to be running their business in the power of God. I mean, that just ought to be part of their life. But, but they're very strong. I, I don't want to say egotistical in a negative way, but, but they use their ego, but they'll check it at the door when they walk into the church. And it's as if humility is, is a trait that they're supposed to have, and they think it's a personality. And, and we both know humility is, a present, is our position in God, not a personality. So I, I think that's part of the problem. They, 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 sort of de they depend more on God in their business than they think, and then they check that when they walk into the church door. You know, I think mine's kind of along the same line as that, but uh, tell me, my, I would just say um, the reason for that intimidation following up on what you're saying is really a theological one, that somehow the pastor or the church staff that may be in the room, depending on the church structure, um, has brings with them this spirituality that you almost got to start talking in whispers. I I was praying last night and I was asking God where we should go and I believe that God led me to he really thinks that we should have three doors in front of the church than two and I really think God's hand is in that. And I want to jump out of the chair and say quit whispering that's nonsense. But yeah. it feels spiritual, doesn't it? I, John, I, I got to tell you, you know, I served at really one of the great churches of the world at, at um, in Dallas, Texas. And you can say the church, can't you? First or Baptist did... Church, Dallas, Texas, which at the time had 30,000 members. It was the largest uh, Protestant church in the United States. Uh, and uh we had literally we, we had some of the finest ceos uh in the world in that in in quote on our deacon board and um uh, i remember we had a like a 12 million dollar debt the interest rate at the time was like 16 percent and so the, the pastor and i worked through a deal to buy the ymca across the church across the uh, uh road from the church 
and we were going to flip it and sell it to Lincoln Properties for a, a significant profit that would be enough to pay off our, our debt as well as get us a church parking lot. It was a phenomenal business deal. And so when the pastor and I brought that recommendation to this, you know, this learned group of CEO deacons, uh, they turned it down. It really made Dr. Chriswell upset. And? And, and Dr. Chriswell was, was blessed in his own right financially. So he decided he would just do the deal himself out of his own pocket. So he bought the YMCA. He, uh, he made the deal with Lincoln Properties. And then we called another Dinkins meeting. And, and he stood before them. <laughs> And sort of in the way that you were talking about, he, he, he used his own personality and he said, I'm just a preacher. I love the Lord. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a CEO. I'm just a preacher. But I went ahead and bought that YMCA and then I sold it to Lincoln Properties. And Mr. Chairman, he asked the chairman to walk over. He said, I want to give you a check for $12 million to pay off our church loan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you, you know, you could tell stories like that all day. I, where we live, let's get, we're in Southern California. Right. And this was years ago. There was a large mission organization that, again, had amazing people on the board. And they were giving of their time, just like your board members were at First Baptist. Uh, but they were in, uh, in Los Angeles. And they needed a place for their missionaries when they came home, kind of a retreat center kind of place for them to come in. And so one of them approached Mr. Irvine and um, was asking, you know, is there any chance we could... Uh, uh, way you could help us here. And so they, this mission organization was offered a fairly substantial piece of property, uh, but the board knew to accept a gift. You know, sometimes you have to be careful about accepting gifts. And they're like, who would want to be down all the way south into Orange County by that little airport? And they passed up on many acres across from John Wayne Airport. Imagine historically, as they look back, I mean, just sometimes stupidity um, can come about because people are trying to be spiritual, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, t tell me this, Tom, uh, you know, as we're talking, you know, we're used to, we're talking pastors and elders and deacons. People just get confused to begin with when you talk about church leaders and you begin yeah. the average discussion of a mixed group of people and one person talks about their priest and somebody else, you know, brings up their, the deacon. Can, can you just begin to explain why is it so confusing? Why, why do all these different names for leaders and churches, where in the world did the idea come from? Well, we, if we really go back to scripture, there are really two, two offices, the elder and the deacon. And, you know, after that, everything becomes somewhat a nomenclature of, of I'm just going to call the organized church. You so know, the, Presby the Presbyterians were right, huh? I guess, yeah, I guess right, and, and that was preordained. <laughs> we know that. But, uh, you know, bottom line is that uh, if we can just use common sense, uh, I call it common sense religion, uh, is that a, a priest is a pastor, you, you know, and, and if we can just start looking through the titles to just who they are from a spiritual perspective, their leaders, uh, and, and maybe do as James said, you know, let's just lay down all of our titles because they can become confusing. Uh, and, and, and just look to, to our spiritual leaders as persons, you know, because they are real persons. Uh, they are called of God, commissioned by God, but, but as we both know, they're, they hurt too. You know, they're, they're just people of hurts uh, that's trying to do their very best. Uh, but yeah, the, these titles can be, you know, I work with churches across the board and I have to learn the different nomenclatures, you know, from vestry to session, the deacon board, to elder group, to leadership team, to SLT, servant leadership team. I mean, it's, it's just all kinds of groups, but they're the same people, just called of God. And in this situation, 
uh, when you have church, then you have leadership. So just let's say we have a group of people and you have leaders. The next thing that happens is it gets controversial about who should be on those boards. And then when somebody who's in that leadership position, they end up doing something that's scandalous. And how does a board deal? Can you tell us one of, I mean, there are just so many bad examples. It, what comes to mind when I talk about that? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, there, the, it's the horror story. I can, I can tell you a story of a church that um, literally the treasurer was a CPA. And a wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful family. Uh, uh, but something happened in his life. W whatever happened in his life that he, at first he had the, the, the knowledge and the know-how. And over a 15 year period, you know, he was able to divert uh, $3.5 million of church funds into his own business. Oh. Uh, uh, you know, it happens, it hurt. That church had to deal with it, obviously, once they, they found out about it. And, and uh, in this case, the church dealt with it lovingly and with grace, uh, but a church is made up of humans. And, and even, even pastors, you, you know, fail. Uh, I, I will tell you a humorous story about failure in, in a pastor's life. And this wasn't a failure, but Dr. Criswell was, he was 80 years old there at First Baptist Dallas. And, and I remember I went to him one, one day. I was, I was frightened because this lady in the church was saying, and she came to me and she said, you know, I'm pregnant. And, and Dr. Criswell is the father. And, and, and remember, he's 80 years old. So I went to him and I said, what do I do, Pastor? What do I do? He started laughing. He said, oh, just ignore it. At my age, that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, okay. Now, so you've got a couple, and I'm just, I'm imagining it. Here we are talking about leaders. It isn't surprising that then you, next, you get into money. And I can hear some of our people just listening and saying, yeah, why does the church have to be about money? I mean, let's get real. That is one of the biggest ways that church hurts people is when it comes to money. My father specifically ended his attendance at church by saying churches are just about money. And it wasn't just, you know, he became a drunk and the, and, and the, the, the booze bottle was more important to him. And then his spiritual life. But apart from that, he had been on the board. He had served well, and he was a wise man in his own way. But he just said, you know, the church is just about money. Yeah, I hear that loud and clear. And, and, and sadly, some of the hurts that's come uh, to people has been about maybe even the way churches receive offerings. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've been in those meetings where, where, uh, as, as I said, old time evangelist would take out his wallet and hold it up and say, now everybody hold up your wallet and just empty it out into the bucket and God's going to bless you. Um, you know, I understand those spiritual principles, but you know, that's, that's what we call manipulation. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and there really have been a few uh, who have been abusive financially. I want to stand up and say for the most part, churches do a great job of, of, of just dealing with finances and being great stewards. But yeah, I mean, you, you've got those persons who were hurt, uh, who, who, who believed with all of their heart that if they gave, they would be blessed financially. You know, it's the prosperity theology concept. And they hear this from preachers, you know, you give and, and you'll be blessed tenfold. And, um, uh, there, there are there are a few ministers out there that really believe that you'll be that every Christian ought to be rich financially, and I know different. I know that we're every Christian is rich in spiritual blessings, but they're not going to be rich financially. But they get hurt. They get hurt deeply because of the abusiveness of of even how churches receive offerings. 
you know, really, we could kind of go down any road. We're talking about money here, but mm -hmm. when it comes to even just bad teaching, I'm, people do the same thing. Here we are in the middle of a shutdown with a, you know, coronavirus, and you have people out there who are just saying, you know what, God's going to protect me, and um, others saying, that's fine, wear a mask. Um, you know, there are those who believe that all of our healing is a result of our sin rather than living in a sinful world. Man, we could go down a lot of those bunny trails. Well, but we, it, it, I, I have a saying for, for some of those type of persons. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. It's not your saying. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? You came up with that. <laughs> you know, I, I probably it's not original, probably with me. But, you know, uh, the, the, so, and, and there are people like that. You know, there. I have I have a pastor right now in Mississippi that that uh, you know through social media we're we're connected and and I was sharing about how churches really need to be careful in this time as they're thinking about reopening, spacing their chairs out. And then, and she said, that's nonsense. And, and uh, you know, there are just a few out there that, that just absolutely refuse to deal with, with reality. And, and they're good people first. Let's just start there. I call them heavenly minded, but they are no earthly good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think of um, how different churches choose leaders. And sometimes that's really where the flaw is, is we don't know the people or we put degrees as a qualification. As um, a good Presbyterian once upon a time, we were the most educated. And the reason the Methodists succeeded in this country because the Presbyterians couldn't produce enough educated preachers. And so, so Methodists came along and said, that's okay, we'll pastor the church. We don't have to graduate Princeton. That was kind of a high bar. Um, but so now we look at it and see people have degrees, they have credentials, and yet sometimes aren't there just people in leadership who really shouldn't be there from a personality gift perspective? How, do, how does that happen? I mean, you know, you, 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 you read my resume, and I, I've certainly served with some of the most educated persons in the world. The, the person that I, that I love most in my life was a man of great wisdom. He was a pastor. He, like you, he started three churches right out of, right out of quote, our home. He was my dad. Uh, he was an alcoholic. God changed his life at the age of 30, but he had a sixth grade education. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's what he remained. He went to a Bible school called Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, which you know about through our, through our foundation. But they gave him a certificate back, back in the late, I mean, early 50s, just a certificate of Bible. But, uh, you know, we understand God gives wisdom. Human, humanity can give us degrees, but only God gives wisdom. Uh, and, yeah, you know, degrees are, are good, important. They show that we've accomplished something. But I'm going to go right back to my dad and, and a lot of people like my dad's. Who, who they're just people of godly wisdom, who love the church, who love the Lord, and they led with great degree of success. My grandmother That's, would say they had a deep well, so what's in the well comes up in the bucket. <laughs> we're gal <laughs> you know tom i should um just call attention for a minute to the fact that you know you do have a foundation that helps guys um who um you know people i shouldn't say just guys helps people who they're going into ministry right. um and you've chosen to use that foundation for that very purpose T tell us just a little bit how that came about yeah well my dad um uh, he was diagnosed with cancer in 1987. And so uh, my sister and I decided we would just try to set up a scholarship fund. It was just, we were just going to do a scholarship to, to maybe help students at Clear Creek College in Pineville, Kentucky. And uh, uh, donations came and God blessed both my brother-in-law and, and sister and, and my own self in the, in the ministry and in the work that I entered into. And uh, the found it, I mean, the, the scholarship fund grew and grew and grew and grew until uh, 
I mean, now it's become a foundation. We have put 126 students full, full, fully through Clear Creek College. We have a fully endowed scholarship at Kettering School of Medical Arts for Nurses in Kettering, Ohio. We have a fully endowed scholarship at Sinclair Community College in, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and last year, we were able to help 25 different organizations, including those three, uh, do amazing things in ministry. And it's just because of, of quote, frankly, investments. Uh, it's from people who've given and, and the heart of my family that we, we want to help others. So you've done so much good stuff. I guess you have a ticket for heaven. Well, <laughs> yeah, I can't earn my way into heaven. It's a free gift offered by, by, by God through Jesus Christ. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm grateful that I've been able to help others. You know, I, I, I believe that, that my need to give is greater than anyone else's need to receive. Uh, and, and that giving is what God wants for me, not from me. And then I get a blessing out of giving. And, you know, John, you know, you know right now you mentioned it. You know, we're, we're in a crisis time and, and a lot of people are hurting. And I know you work with pastors uh, around the country. I mean, that's, that's just what you do. I, I work with them in the field of generosity and church growth and visioning. But you work with some of them that I work with just in helping them because they're hurting. I mean, I got a call last night from a friend that, that their pastor had committed suicide. And, you know, in this last year, I don't know, I guess there's been, I think about eight in my life, eight pastors that, that uh, they took their own life. I just love to hear from you. I mean, what's going on right now, this pandemic with these, with these good people. Oh, Tom, you know, uh, I appreciate you asking. And I know that's where your heart is. And the truth of the matter is, these guys are busier than ever and their hearts are going out because they're being stretched so many ways. They have people who are scared to begin with and who some of whom are asking big spiritual questions. When, when you have times like this, a lot of times people are starting to say, wait, there might be more of this. What if it gets me? What about my family? And what's God doing in, in the whole situation? And, and these, um, uh, leaders in the church right now are just so stretched. And at the same time, they've been really available to receive phone calls just to process it. And some of it comes down to your field. What are they going to do financially? Church giving is down 30 to 50% in most churches. Uh, a couple of my best friends, their giving hasn't been touched because their people are kind of rallying. And they're saying, no, nah, this isn't going to get us, you know. And and um, But what's the wisdom of how to come back? And that's where we really can't have leaders cutting off their heads when they go into those conference calls and zoom meetings, right? They got to be wise. And, um, so I would just, um, well, I want to thank you, Tom, and, and just kind of wrap us up by saying this, we indulge here, allowing ourselves to be a little bit overcritical sometimes, and certainly a, a good bit of cynicism, but reality is this is really a time to pray for leaders and to pray for pastors. Sometimes um, people don't realize that those in leadership who get a lot of adulation and get a lot of attention, yeah, that's given, but they also get a lot of criticism and in their um, own insecurities sometimes can get so depressed because they suffer um, just like the rest of us. And some uh, suffer from addictions and some suffer from mental illnesses. And um, they really need the awareness and the support of those around them. So matter, no matter how frustrated you may have been in the past with some church leader, um, let me just ask you, would you pray for one today? And it's worth a thought. For Church Hurts and this is John Bash. Enjoy God today, won't you? And that brings us to the close of another edition of Church Hurts and leaving us, as always, with a lot to think about. If you want to continue the conversation with Dr. John Bash, he's a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of losing or leaving their ministry. You can find out more about John's work at standingstoneministry.org. And next week, yes, there is a next week, we look at singleness and marriage in the church. 
with a special guest who knows this topic all too well. See you then.